Chris is going to introduce our first speaker. Bust out my digital notepad. Okay. I'll screw it up. Um, <coughs> all right, so it is a great pleasure that um, I was asked to be um, able to introduce Adam Thunderbolt, who is a coworker of mine and a, a lovely human being. The Buddha would be proud, I always say. Um, can you hear me now? Better? Okay. So um, Adam Thunderberg, uh, LPC, is a psychotherapist at the Anxiety and Stress Management Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. He works primarily with anxiety disorders and OCD, and he uses mindfulness as an approach. Um, but it's a treatment modality and a philosophical approach to his work with clients. Um, one of the cool things about Adam is that his own practice of mindfulness meditation goes back 20 years. Um, starting with the introduction of martial arts training, yes, he could totally kick my butt and those <laughs> but he doesn't because he's that nice. Um, but it's also deepened over the last 10 years through his practice with Theravada Buddhism. He combines mindfulness practice with more traditional therapeutic modalities, such as ERP, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and I can say from my, what my own eyes have seen at the group practice where we work that he has very positive results with clients, and probably one of the most popular um, free groups I've ever seen, period. So, um, so if you just round of applause for me. For You can take it out if you want to. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me here. And um, like Chris was saying, uh, I, I work at the Anxiety and Stress Management Institute, and I, I've i been involved with mindfulness for most of my, now most of my life. It's interesting to think of it that way. Um, and I find it very helpful, but also found that it's very popular now. No, so how many people have heard of mindfulness? have ever heard that term. So actually more than half of the people in the room actually have. Um, and so it's become a lot more popular of a term, but I find that sometimes people have questions about it. What is mindfulness? And how does it work? And why does it matter? Uh, well, particularly with OCD, like, like how, what's the connection? Um, so to get started, I'd like to talk about, so what is mindfulness? Like, what does it mean? Uh, there's a lot of different ways of defining mindfulness. For instance, um, you could say open awareness. I've heard non-judgmental um, awareness of the present moment. The definition that I like to use, and the one that I use the most with clients, is John Kabat-Zinn. And for those of you who aren't familiar with John Kabat-Zinn, he is a, a mindfulness teacher. He probably popularized mindfulness in the West probably more than anyone else. About 30 years he's been doing research with mindfulness. Um, and there's been a lot of positive results with what he's done. But his definition for mindfulness, and the one I use because I think it's simple and I think it's helpful, is awareness of the present moment without judgment. So, pretty simple, straightforward, but I think it needs some unpacking. So, what does that mean? I mean sure, I'm aware of what's going on. So, what, is, what does even awareness mean? So, you, you know this present moment. But what is the present moment? What would it include? Um, there's thoughts, uh, feelings, emotions, a little bit higher, uh, physical sensations. All these things are occurring in the present moment. Many times all the things are occurring at once. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell where one begins and the other ends. So like right now as we're sitting here, I'll ask the question, can you feel your left foot? on the ground. And when I, until I said that, did, were you aware of your left foot? Like was it actually in your consciousness that, oh, my left foot's on the ground and I can feel? So, well there it is. It's like, so now that I'm thinking about it, I can, I can feel my left foot on the ground. But also I feel other things. Like I can, so the left foot's there, I'm talking, I feel well, there's tightness in my stomach because I'm talking in front of all these people. Um, I'm holding a microphone. Um, there's thoughts about it. Um, all this is occurring all at once. And so mindfulness is a way of looking at that experience. It's a way of seeing thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings, sensations as sensations. And as far as I know, that's what's occurring in the present moment. Like I haven't actually experienced anything other than those three things. Like, and so um, now they feed one another. So a lot of times I might have a feeling, 
um, and it creates thoughts about the feeling. Um, or maybe I've got a physical sensation in my body, I feel it, it's like, oh, okay, well now I might be thinking, oh, what's that, what's going on there, or oh, this, maybe this is a problem, or, you know, oh, I like this feeling. There's, the thoughts can occur for any number of reasons, or you could think something, and you might feel something about what you thought. Um, it all feeds one another, but yet there's actually separate things. And so as you practice mindfulness, and one of the things about the practice of mindfulness is being able to see your experience as you experience it. Because what you're looking at is, well, I'll, the last part of that statement of awareness of the present moment without judgment. So awareness of the present moment, that makes sense. Straightforward, we're aware of what's happening in this moment. But the without judgment part is actually the most useful part, but also the most difficult part. Um, because, you know, we're human. Like, if, if it's unpleasant, we don't like it. If it's pleasant, we like it. We want more of it. If it's neutral, eh, we're going to ignore it for the most part. Um, but one of the benefits of mindfulness, and one of the things that I've found most useful for myself in my own practice, but also with clients, and just working with people in general is the ability just to see the experience without judging the experience. But again, that's hard. Because, well, let's say this. It's like, okay, so if you stub your toe, it's painful. You know, it hurts. Uh, but in and of itself, that's a physical sensation. But we might have thought about it, like, ah, oh, look at this here. Like, wow, like, oh, that was stupid. Why did they do that? Like, uh, I'm going to trip over this. But that's a, a judgment. That's a thought about, oh, this is pain in my toe. Or maybe the pain in the toe, I don't like it. Like, oh, this is horrible. I hate having pain in my toe. I really don't like that. Okay. There's the pain in the toe. There's the thought about the toe. And maybe I'm feeling some emotion about that. And maybe I feel upset that my toe is hurting. Uh, those are, I know some people who have been in my group before, uh, so they've heard this story probably many times, and I'm probably going to have to get a new uh, injury so that way I can keep it fresh. But like two years ago, I did, actually I broke my toe. And so anybody who's ever had a broken toe knows that there's really not much you can do about it. You know, once it's set, and it's like, okay, it's just got to kind of heal. And it hurts sometimes. And sometimes for no particular reason, you can sit there and the toe just starts to hurt. And if it's like, ah, oh, there's a, there's a, I can't believe by what I did, and I, I kicked that thing, now my cardio's going back, so I can't run, and I'm probably going to gain some weight, I won't be able to compete in this thing, because now I, you know, I can't kick anybody, because my toe's broken. Um, so that's all these thoughts that come from, like, a sensation, and what's actually happening is there's a slight discomfort in my toe. And that's, that's what's actually happening. That's the, that's the experience. And so, you can say it's a completely natural and normal and human to judge our experience, to evaluate our experience, to, to make sense of it in that way. But it's also, it's within our capabilities just to be aware of it. Um, a lot of times, particularly with painful things. Now, with, with happy things, we, we like getting swept up into those things. It's very fun to, uh, to get involved in something that feels you know, very happy. Like you're watching a great movie, and you really get into it, and you, you kind of forget yourself while you really get involved in the movie. But that's usually not where the problem lies. It's usually when there's difficult emotions, difficult thoughts, uh, difficult experiences, typically are where we get stuck. We tend to get really enmeshed into those thoughts and experiences. And so mindfulness is a tool for unraveling that, for being able to see it clearly for what it is, not for what we think it is or what we think it should be or shouldn't be. Should or shouldn't is not part of the, the mindfulness experience. You may notice thoughts that say, oh, this should be this way, but that's a thought. It's a thought, a should thought maybe. Um, and so that brings me to the point of why does this, why does this matter? Okay, so, so you're aware of the present moment, you're aware of what's happening, you're aware 
of the judgments, the thoughts, and you're staying present too, because that's also become kind of a buzzword, you stay present, but what does being present mean? Okay, these thoughts of the past and future occur all the time. Um, but it's getting caught in those thoughts. That's, that's when we're not mindful. Um, so again, why this matters? So I, I saw like a, a demonstration one time and I thought it was funny, but so you go to the, uh, the auto dealer and it's time to buy a new car. And the guy buying the car takes you over to the car and says, here's the car, here you go. Okay, look at it, do, do you like it? Do, do you want to buy this car? So, I don't know. Um, it's right here. And sometimes our experience is right here. It's so in our face, it's so, you can't see anything else but the experience. Uh, or that little piece of the experience maybe. So I don't know if the cars are good or not. He could have me up against the wall maybe. Like, it's not even a car. Um, but, you can step back, you look at the whole thing, and then you can make a decision about it. You can decide, okay, do I want this car? You know, is this useful? You know, maybe, maybe I don't like the color, maybe I don't like the shape. But you have to be able to see it. So part of the practice of mindfulness and why to me it matters and why it's important, it gives the mind the space to be able to make a decision about it, to see it. Um, one of the allegories for mindfulness, another way that they talk about it, is creating space. You create space in the mind. Um, and again, uh, you can imagine in a very cramped space, you can't, there's not a lot of choices or movement. So if you're like in a really tight space, there's really not many things you can do in that space. The bigger the space, the more like this room here, there's a lot you can play, you know, carpet basketball if you want to. You can do uh, there's lots of things to do. Um, but there's a lot of space, so that you've got choice, you've got options. But when it's tight, you really don't. And so a big part of mindfulness practice, a big part of why I think this is very helpful stuff, it can create more space in the mind. It can help you to have choices, have options. Um, so for instance, if something happens a certain way. Look, I use traffic a lot, because those of you from Atlanta are probably, most places have a lot of traffic. But, you know, you pull out in traffic, sometimes that's just the experience. Now we can get upset about it. That's always a possibility. Um, we can have lots of thoughts about, you know, the, the guy in front of us, oh, what's he, already learned to drive. But, you know, it could be the Dalai Lama in front of us, too. Like, maybe he just pulled out in front of you by accident. But we make up all sorts of stories about the person, or the situation, or the thing which in turn feeds the way we feel about it, so then we feel worse about it, so then we, some more stories come up, and we, it just becomes a cycle. We get really caught in that cycle. Um, one analogy they say, if you've ever like, been watching a really good movie, say it's an emotional kind of a tearjerker, so you're watching it, you're really caught up in the story, and you, know, you just feel everything they're feeling on the screen, you have this shift, and you look, and okay, there's a guy next to you, popcorn, the light from the screen, and there's little dust motes in it, and you realize, oh, okay, this is, I'm in a theater, this is a, this is a movie, it's a screen. But just a second ago, we were so caught up in the story, I mean, we're, I mean we might be crying, like you might think, or, or, or angry, or whatever it is, whatever we're watching on the screen. And our minds do that all the time. Like the mind, we really get caught up in the story, a lot. Um, and, you know, it's a very human thing. It's, it's, it's not like that's unusual, like part of being human is having stories and having things that we tell, but it's very easy to mistake the story for the experience. And sometimes the experience may not be the same as what the mind is saying. But to be able to recognize, oh, okay, well, I've got my feeling, I've got emotion, there's thoughts, and I can see, I can see these things. I can see each thing. Um, it sounds very simple. I mean, it's like, in fact, it is very simple. It's not, it's not a terribly complicated concept, but it, it's, it's difficult. Um, I use the analogy sometimes of running up a very steep hill. You know, it's not really complicated, but it's hard. You know, it's, um, it's hard to remember to be mindful. Because being mindful, so right now, so everybody, because you just felt your foot. Okay, so notice the temperature on your hands. 
And so maybe a second ago, it, the attention wasn't there, but just in a second, you can notice mine are a little cold. Um, so you just kind of notice the temperature. And that's fairly easy to do. You just were mindful. But the thing that makes it difficult is when we get caught up in strong emotions, strong thoughts, um, difficult experiences, or we just get busy. Um, we don't remember to be mindful. Um, so part of the practice of mindfulness, and part of the thing which, again, this is what I'll talk about next, is how you do this stuff, is remembering to be mindful as often as you can. Um, I venture to say this, and I always take a risk saying this because, you know, we got a lot of different people, lots of different experiences, but so far it's been most of the happiest experiences I've ever heard about or been a part of myself, people have been mindful during those experiences. So for instance, you're really with that person. You're on the beach feeling the sun. You're tasting that food. You're, you're there completely. And it's really nice when the experience is nice. Now, one of the misconceptions about mindfulness, so let's talk about some of that. Like one of the misconceptions of mindfulness is that it's to make things pleasant. Which, pleasant is a possibility. You know, there's pleasant things that happen to us. But there's also unpleasant things that happen. There's neutral things. Um, like right now, if I said, okay, what does the, the middle right of your back feel like? Well, right now I don't feel anything right there. So it's a very neutral sort of feeling. Um, or what does the space between your two breaths feel like? Nothing really for me, but like, um, so there's a lot of neutral sensation too, there's a lot of neutrality going on. But our experience tends to be like, if it's pleasant, we like it, we want more of it, so we tend to like, oh, give me some more of that, I don't want to let this go. If it's unpleasant, we tend to not like it, oh, get it away, I don't want this, stay away. If it's neutral, we kind of ignore it. It's like, oh, okay, well, give me something interesting to think about, or something to do. But, pleasant, going back to non-judgment, pleasant doesn't mean good, and unpleasant doesn't mean bad. That's the judgment part of it. So for instance, like today was kind of cold, so we're walking in here, and you may love the cold weather, like I happen to like the cold weather, so it's like I walk outside, it's cold, ah, oh, cold, I like this. But maybe you don't like the cold weather, and you're like, ah, oh, cold, ah, why is it cold? But the cold, good or bad, or like it or not like it, is not a, a feature of cold. Like it has nothing to do with cold. Cold is cold. Or, well, actually, cold is not even cold. That's even a judgment. Cold is the temperature is a certain, a certain number of degrees temperature. That's what's happening. So this is what it feels like. Whether you like it or not is the judgment. And part of the practice of mindfulness, again, why this is important, again, to reiterate this point, like why I think it's important, is because it's very easy to fall into judgment and not realize that we're judging it. We have the experience, and automatically there's the judgment, and we, it happens so quickly we don't even know that it's separate. We don't even know that it, it's a judgment. We just know that, okay, it's here, I don't like it, it's bad. Immediately. The more you can sit back and see the experience, practice seeing the experience, it's easier to disentangle those two and recognize, okay, just because it's uncomfortable, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It doesn't mean horrible. It means unpleasant. Because pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, they happen before judgment. You know, you've got any experience, like you think of it, like you, know, you might hear a sound, and before you even know what it is, like, oh, it's a nice sound. Oh, it's a bird. Or you might hear a sound, like, ah, what's that? It's like someone scraping their fingers on the board. And pleasant, unpleasant, neutral has nothing to do with whether we like it or not. It just that's, that's the tone of that experience. Maybe it's a thought, maybe it's a feeling. But the judgment comes next. And so part of practicing mindfulness is practicing seeing the experience, even if it's unpleasant, and saying, okay, this is an unpleasant experience, but I don't need to add more to it. Like, I don't need to add a story to this. Um, so it kind of brings me to the last part. It's like, so how do you practice? And the key word there is practice. Because, has any, does anybody know how to ride a bike? If you do, you can raise your hand. Alright, so I'll ask, um, who 
would like to answer the question. Okay. So, how do you ride a bike? Okay. So you okay, get on there. And yeah. Do, okay. Um, how do you keep your balance? How do you do that? Um, Just do. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> what's mom it? holds the back of the bike. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, so the mom holds the back. Um, okay. So 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 what are you doing to keep your balance? I like to, like. Um, I guess you kind of like sit up and like the more you pedal. Like the easier the bike is going to stay in balance. That's that's as good an answer as I have. So that's really good. Um, and and the, the reason why I have the whole reason to it's it's really hard to describe what you're doing like when you're keeping your balance. Like if anybody's like I mean I don't I mean, there's probably a lot of micro changes. I mean, there's lots of little things that are happening, but it's hard to actually describe it. But once you get it, you you kind of know how to keep your balance. Like. You understand on a very instinctive level how to keep your balance, or or be like if, if anybody has anybody ever played a competitive sport or anything like that. And for instance, like okay, I understand the game of tennis because I had a family member that liked it, but I don't practice tennis, so I understand tennis cognitively. Like I can look at a game and kind of know what's going on. But if you put me on the court and start bobbing balls at me, it's like it's not going to be pretty. Because you could say so the, the concept is there, but I don't have the practice. And so it's the same thing with mindfulness. Like again, it's a it's a simple concept, you know, awareness in the present moment without judgment. Simple. But it's difficult because the practice is what makes it work. It's it'd be like if the only time you ever practiced tennis was when you were in a match. That would be very difficult to develop skill in that because it's like spending hours and hours practicing your serve, knocking the ball. There's all things that, these things you do to develop that skill. It's the same thing with mindfulness. So one of the misconceptions about mindfulness is, okay, I'm going to use it to calm myself down. Now mindfulness can have a long-term effect of calming the mind, but not because you're making it get calm. Like it's not a relaxation tool. Um, seeing what is, and what is may be unpleasant, and very not very relaxing. Um, over time, like I've noticed myself and the people I have known practice for a while, you get less reactive to the things that happen, so in general there's some calmness that occurs, because the things that happen you don't tend to react so strongly to it, but it's not because you're making it be calm. Um, another misconception about practice, which um, is that you have to stop your thoughts. Like I've heard lots of people tell me that, like, oh, I can't meditate because I, I can't stop my thinking. Luckily, in mindfulness, you don't have to. Um, mindfulness meditation, there are types of meditation uh, that the thoughts do stop, but they're not mindfulness meditation. There are other forms of meditation out there, and more power to them, it's all good. But mindfulness meditation, the goal is not to stop thinking. It's actually just to know that you're thinking and recognize it. You don't have to, like, so say the thought's there. Whatever it is, maybe it's complaining about the situation, maybe it's worried about the situation, maybe it, who knows what the thought is saying. But just to know that it's there. Oh, there's, there's the thought. Yes, it's the thought. Same thing. The feeling's there. Oh, here's the feeling. It's an uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, anxiety, for instance. Like, anxiety is a very uncomfortable feeling. Fear is uncomfortable. It's a very powerful feeling, a very primal feeling, but it's it's, a, it's not meant to be comfortable. You know, it's, it's designed to protect us. You know, it wants to get you out of danger. It's like there's a bear there. You, gotta, you know, it doesn't want you to sit around. It wants you to act. But it can be just uncomfortable. Like it doesn't have to, you don't really have to do anything about it. Same thing in physical sensation. Now, you can make choices to protect yourself. Like if it's really cold and you're going to get frostbite, okay, it might be good to cover up. But if it's just uncomfortable, okay, it can be just uncomfortable. It doesn't need a story. Um, but because we're so habituated, our minds just do that. That's why practicing mindfulness is important. Um, you can only use it when you need it if you've been practicing. Um, if, it's, if it's like a, just a, a trick up your sleeve to try and like not feel something, 
doesn't work. Again, it comes back to um, you know, like trying to play tennis only when you've got a match going on. It's just it's you have to build the, the basic skills. But the more you practice it, the easier it gets to use it when you need it, and the easier it gets to see the difference between a thought, a feeling, and a sensation. You just notice and see it. And it becomes instinctive, like riding the bike and keeping your balance. It's not like someone tells you how, how do you sit with an uncomfortable feeling. It's like, okay, it's, it's kind of like the balance. Like, you, you figure out how to do it. You, you feel how to do that. Um, it's not pleasant, but then it's not supposed to be pleasant. It's an unpleasant sensation. But it doesn't have a story. You notice the thoughts that come up connected to that. That's good. There's the thoughts, here's the feeling. Oh, there's a physical sensation going on too, but my heart rate's increasing. Um, so that to me is, is why like when when you talk about mindfulness as something as a helpful concept or a helpful modality to use, finding a way to practice it regularly is a good idea. And there's formal practice when you see people meditating, see the monks sitting on the ground. That's a formal practice of mindfulness. Um, there's walking meditation, where where I sit, I walk, and I feel my feet, just as I walk. And when my mind wanders, I notice that it's wandered, and come back. There's eating meditation. You know, if you're eating your food, you smell it, taste it, notice the sensations. And if the mind wanders, ah, mind wander, come on back. It's you can be mindful in any activity that you. That's why I like it actually is uh, better than a lot of other forms of meditation because you can be mindful when you're not meditating. So you're driving your car. Instead of the mind everywhere, be in your car. Pay attention to the experience. Um, you're talking with somebody. Say it's a boring conversation too. You know, say it's even this speech. You know, you're like, okay, how long is this going to last? Um, and you're listening, but you just notice and you come back. You come back to the experience. The thing that typically being human, like this is our thing that typically takes us away from the experience, is the thought. Usually it's like thoughts about it, judging this, judging that, oh I don't like this, I like this, what's he saying, when's lunch, what's going on, there's all sorts of things going on. But just knowing, okay, there's the thought, come back to the experience, come back to whatever it is that you're choosing to put your attention on. So whether it be your feet on the floor, your breath, your breath is very traditional, uh, food, conversation, feeling the sun on your face. There's lots of ways to be mindful. Um, exercise is good when you run, be mindful. Um, but the more you practice it regularly, the more you take a minute just to recognize, okay, maybe you're just walking and you're thinking something, okay, so let me, let me be here. Let me feel my feet. Let me remember I'm in this place. Um, it's, it's a good practice and it gets easier the more you do it, just like practicing anything. The, the more you practice noticing and coming back, that experience gets a lot easier. Uh, it gets more instinctive, more reflexive. Um, it becomes more your default way of seeing things as opposed to this thing that you do. So that is the basic practice of mindfulness and why I think it's important. And particularly with, um, because with OCD, and well, people here know, it's like it's the thoughts, it's getting caught up in that experience. And again, like my nose here, you can't see anything when you're so caught up in the thoughts. It's like that's all that's your experience. So that ability to be able to step back and see it and mindfully be with what's uncomfortable. Mindfully be with the thought. Mindfully be with the feeling. Again, it doesn't, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that's just the changing characteristics. One thing that I like, um, there was a guy named Matthew Ricard, and he was uh, he's actually a French, what was he, molecular biologist that became a Tibetan monk. So, okay, so following the story here. Um, when they were doing research on happiness and, and meditation and mindfulness, and they wanted to see, like, uh, so he was an obvious choice because he's, he has a scientific background. So they thought, okay, it's good. He's been a monk all these years, and he's got a scientific background. And so, there's a part of the prefrontal cortex that registers positive emotions. So, like, the part of the brain that when it lights up, people are experiencing positive emotion. And his lit up 
brighter than they've ever seen in anybody's life. Like, so he got the name in the media, the happiest man in the world. Which is ironic that it annoyed him because, you know, the, the title happiest man in the world annoyed the happiest man in the world. Because he didn't give it to himself. Um, but what was interesting when the guy I was interviewing asked him, he said, well, what is it like being the happiest man in the world? Like, do you ever get sad? Like, what, what's that all about? And he said, it's kind of like this. When it's storming, the ocean can be very choppy. Like, there can be really high waves. There can be very violent conditions on the surface. But as you go deeper, it gets still. And that never changes. And so, the way he described his experience, is like, yes, there's, there's unpleasant things that happen. There's pleasant things that happen. There's happiness, there's sadness, there's, there's emotion always occurring. But there's an awareness of that that's underneath it that doesn't actually change. It's, it's watching the whole experience. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting fact. Our experience of being human is the fact that we've got this part of ourselves that can observe the experience, see it, but not necessarily be part of it. And just, uh, this is happening. Don't have to change it, don't have to do anything about it. And that's the piece that he talked about, um, which I always thought that was kind of cool because you can you can actually practice that and experience it yourself. It's and that's again practice because like this is not me just saying it because I'm just like I'm just you know trying to vouch for mindfulness. Oh, that's great! Everybody try it. Yeah, you gotta have enough you know interest to give it a try, but it's your own experience that is the the proof of it. That's what I've always liked about it. It's like it's. It's what you experience. It's, are you able to sit with this thought? Are you able to hold that unpleasantness, hold that fear, and be with it? And not have to change it, not have to turn it away, not have to make it anything else. Let it be what it is. And then when you can do that on your own, you see it yourself. <laughs> to me, that's where the, the biggest changes happen. And what I see, like, when people take it and make it their own, it's like, it's amazing to me what I've seen um, and what I've seen people do with that. And so, anyway, so that, that's why I think it's important. So I appreciate you for having me and having me come talk a little bit about this. And um, I've got some more speakers.